Welcome to the National Archives Know Your Records program. My name is Andrea Matney. Before I turn the program over to our presenter, Rachel Sawyer, let's begin with an introduction and instructions on how to participate. The goal of the Know Your Records program is to provide you with information on how to access and conduct research using U.S. federal government records held at the National Archives and Records Administration. You can participate during the premiere broadcast by joining the conversation with the presenter and other audience members. Here's how to engage in the live chat. You can ask questions via chat by first logging into YouTube. Continue to watch chat because the speaker will answer your questions there in the chat. Type your questions in at any time and we will ask that you keep your questions on today's topic. In addition, Please select Show More to find links to the handouts and the events evaluation form. Our presentation is entitled, The Records of the Provost Marshal General and Enemy Prisoners of War Held in the United States During World War II by Rachel Sawyer. Rachel is a subject matter expert in modern military records and an archivist from the National Archives at College Park, Maryland, also known as Archives II. Rachel started her career at the National Archives in 2015 as an archives technician in the textual research room at Archives 2, became an archivist in textual processing the following year. Since 2019, Rachel has served as an archivist in the augmented processing and reference sections of Archives 2 textual records division. Rachel has a Bachelor's of Arts degree in English and German from Oklahoma Baptist University a Master of Arts and a Doctor of Philosophy degree in German Studies from the University of Massachusetts Amherst, and a Master of Science in Library and Information Science with an Archives concentration from Simmons University. Prior to coming to the National Archives, Rachel worked as a Professor of English Composition, Literature, and German at various colleges and universities in Massachusetts. Rachel, Thank you for offering this presentation. I'm now turning it over to you. Hi, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. I'm Rachel Salyer, and I'm an archivist in the Textual Records Division at the National Archives in College Park. Today, I'll be talking about Record Group 389, the records of the Office of the Provost Marshal General. Although I will focus on records related to enemy prisoners of war during World War II, I will start with some background information about the history of the Office of the Provost Marshal General and the history of enemy prisoners of war. I will go over some of the series that are found within Record Group 389 before showing several examples of documents found there as well. Then I'll close by sharing links to related records and resources. First, I wanted to provide a little bit of background information as context for the later developments and decisions that were made leading up to and during World War II. Historically, a Provost Marshal General has been appointed in the U.S. during times of war, and then the office was subsequently dissolved after each war. The duties changed a bit during each iteration of the office, but in general, the Provost Marshal General was responsible for maintaining discipline, policing troops, enforcing the draft, and so on. The late 19th and early 20th centuries brought about many changes in international laws governing the treatment and employment of prisoners of war. Despite the fact that not all belligerent nations had signed the Hague Conventions of 1907, the U.S. did work to abide by those conventions while making preparations and plans for POWs during World War I. There was extensive back and forth between the War Department and various individuals, offices, and organizations, but it was eventually decided that most POWs would actually remain in Europe and would not be sent to the U.S. in World War I. At the same time, some preparations were still made stateside in anticipation of potential POWs. It was also decided that POWs could be employed in the U.S. in a limited capacity, and in March of 1918, regulations governing those practices were issued. It turned out that very few prisoners were ever actually held in the U.S. during World War I. These early experiences definitely informed later decision-making leading up to World War II. As World War I was ending, numerous prisoner of war companies were formed in Europe. Prisoners were paid a minimum of 20 centimes per day, which was credited to individual accounts rather than distributed directly to prisoners of war. 
And again, these experiences shaped later decisions that were made in World War II. In his final report, Brigadier General Harry A. Bandholtz, who served as the Provost Marshal General of the American Expeditionary Forces, argued against the dissolution of the Military Police Corps and the Provost Marshal General's Department. He also advised against continuing to depend on the same type of emergency measures that had been used during World War I. Despite General Bandholtz's report, both the Office of the Provost Marshal General and the Military Police Corps were dissolved after World War I, so the Operations Division of the War Department General Staff took over the post-war responsibility of planning for potential future prisoners of war. Another important development after World War I were the Geneva Conventions, which later governed how POWs could be treated and employed during World War II. In general, POWs were required to work for the benefit of their captors. However, that work could not be directly related to war operations and could not jeopardize the health and safety of the prisoners. It was also determined that prisoners should be employed in work that suited their skills and certain categories of protected personnel like medical personnel and chaplains were also established. Although there was no Provost Marshal General or Military Police Corps at the time, the Military Police Basic Field Manual of 1937 provided for the potential future activation of a new Provost Marshal. In accordance with the Geneva Conventions, plans were also made for a Prisoner of War Information Bureau and for record keeping and information sharing related to prisoners of war. These were all very high level plans that left most details to be worked out upon the actual activation of the new Provost Marshal General. It was not very long after the basic field manual was issued that emergency planning and activation became necessary. At the end of 1939, mobilization regulations were issued and throughout 1940 and the first half of 1941, other offices and organizations like the Adjutant General's Office were acting on an interim basis to perform some of the tasks that would eventually become the responsibility of the Office of the Provost Marshal General. The appointment of the Provost Marshal General in the summer of 1941 was approved with the initial primary goal of managing the internment of enemy aliens, and a few months later, the Corps of Military Police was also established. That brings us to the Office of the Provost Marshal General during World War II, which is the office as it was during the time when the records we'll be discussing today were created. Three different men held the position of Provost Marshal General during the course of World War II, and then led the transition to the first non-wartime office of the Provost Marshal General as the war ended. Although both the Office of the Provost Marshal General and the Military Police Corps were established in 1941, before the U.S. officially entered the war, there were no permanent internment camps in use or under construction at that time. That began to change in 1942. For example, the Civilian Enemy Aliens and Prisoners of War Manual that was issued by the War Department in 1942 provided details on the types of labor that POWs could be expected to perform. Class I labor involved all routine work that was required to run the camps themselves, things like cooking, cleaning, laundry, maintenance, and so forth. Class II labor encompassed all other work. In anticipation of labor shortages in the US, POWs would be authorized to perform contract work for outside employers, so guidelines were also established that outlined the responsibilities of the government, the employers, and the prisoners. Although some of these rules changed throughout the course of the war, some basic principles remained constant. The government would guard, clothe, quarter, and transport POWs, as well as provide their medical care and employers had to provide necessary equipment and materials for their POW laborers and also supervise the POWs while they were working outside the camps. Payment and scheduling issues were also addressed. In 1942, there was no agreement with enemy nations to establish a minimum labor rate for POWs, so the War Department set the rate at 80 cents per day, which was roughly based on the $21 monthly salary that privates in the U.S. Army earned in 1941. Throughout the war, the U.S. either paid POWs in canteen coupons or credited their earnings to individual accounts, as had been done in World War I. And here you can see an organizational chart for the entire Office of the Provost Marshal General as of April 1944. I know the font is small. Uh, the main thing to note here is that the Office of the Provost Marshal General was not just responsible for the Prisoner of War Division and the Military Police Division. There were divisions for military personnel, military government, internal security, personnel security, the Industrial Employment Review Board, and more. 
So although we will be focusing on series in record group 389 that relate to enemy POWs, there are other records related to these other divisions in RG389 as well. And as you can see on this close-up of the organizational chart from the previous page, each division was further divided into several subordinate offices. Within the Prisoner of War Division, which is the left column here, there is the POW Information Bureau, which was further divided into an American section and an enemy section. And there was also a camp operations branch, a legal branch, a work projects branch, and a field liaison branch as of April 1944. The military police division can be seen in the column on the right here. When you are searching for documents within Record Group 389, it can be helpful to know the names and functions of these offices, since federal records are primarily organized according to the federal agencies and offices that created them. The earliest plans for permanent camps, that is camps that would hold POWs for the duration of the war, were actually made in preparation for the internment of civilians who were considered enemy aliens. However, early in the war, the U.S. agreed to take custody of 150,000 POWs from the British. So several camps that were initially being constructed for enemy aliens were instead used to hold the first group of enemy POWs that were transferred to the U.S. The locations for new camps were selected based on a number of factors. First, there were security regulations in coastal zones that restricted POW camps in those areas. So there were fewer camps and prisoners held on the coasts, especially on the West Coast. Next, mild climates were preferred since the costs for heating, bedding, and clothing in the wintertime would be minimized. Plus, it was determined that the camps should be in locations that could provide the most employment opportunities for the POWs. The War Department and the Office of the Provost Marshal General worked from the assumption that most POWs would be unskilled laborers. That is, that they would not have specialized training, education, or experience. So it was believed that manual labor on farms, in forestry, and in road or runway construction would be the primary work of POWs. In addition, while some POW camps were added to existing military facilities, others were completely new and were built at separate locations exclusively as POW camps. At the end of 1942, there were barely more enemy POWs held in the US than had been held here during the entirety of World War I. But by the end of 1943, there were over 170,000 enemy POWs in the US. That number continued to increase until the end of the war when there were over 425,000 POWs being held in camps across the United States. By June of 1946, all enemy POWs had been returned to their countries of origin, except for a small number who had been charged with criminal offenses that occurred during their time in the POW camps. The numbers fluctuated a bit throughout the war, but the vast majority of POWs, roughly 85%, were German. The next largest group were Italian, followed by relatively few Japanese POWs. For the most part, prisoners from each country were kept together, so most camps only held prisoners from a single country. Although general guidelines for the use of POW labor had been outlined in the years leading up to the war, the specifics were not ironed out until late summer 1943. Because the number of POWs drastically increased during 1943, and because critical manpower shortages occurred during that same year, it was crucial for the War Department and the War Manpower Commission to create a contract that would govern the use of POW labor. The agreement that was enacted in 1943 remained in place throughout the war. In response to this agreement and in accordance with the Geneva Conventions, the Office of the Provost Marshal General outlined three levels of priorities for POW labor. That POW labor was calculated in terms of what's known as man hours and man months, or the amount of work that the average man could be expected to complete in one hour or one month. During the 15 month period from June 1944 to August 1945, enemy POWs provided over 850,000 man months of labor in critical industries like agriculture, lumber, food processing, manufacturing, and more. That averages out to over 56,000 man months per month, or roughly the equivalent to the amount of work that 56,000 men could perform each month. This does not include work that the POWs were assigned within the confines of the camps themselves. This map shows the locations of the POW base and branch camps in the US as of June 1st, 1944. By April of the following year, 
there were 150 base camps and 340 branch camps. And you can see already from this map that they were heavily concentrated in the South, Southwest, and Midwest, although almost every state had at least one or two camps. The capacity of the camps ranged anywhere from just 250 POWs up to 3,000. Unlike with previous wars, the Office of the Provost Marshal General was not dissolved after World War II. Instead, it continued throughout the 50s and 60s until it was abolished in 1974. The current Office of the Provost Marshal General was reestablished 20 years ago and is still operating today. In addition, the Military Police Corps was also not abolished after World War II and remains part of the Army today. So that overview of the Office of the Provost Marshal General and POW camps during World War II may have given you a sense of the types of documents and information that can be found in Record Group 389. But now let's take a closer look at some specific series that are available and also at a few things that are not found in Record Group 389. First, it is important to know that Record Group 389 does not include detailed information about individual prisoners, and there are no personal belongings like letters or diaries from individual POWs. The records of individual POWs were returned to their countries of origin after the war. So if you would like to learn more about a specific German, Italian, or Japanese prisoner, for example, you would need to contact the military archives of those countries directly. In addition, these records are almost exclusively textual records. Although there may be some photographs or maps interspersed with the other records, you will not find extensive non-textual records in RG389. Plus, most of these records have not been digitized, so you will likely need to plan a research visit to Archives 2 if you would like to view any of these records. If you have questions about RG389, you may email the Textual Reference Branch for more information. You may use the National Archives catalog to browse the 135 series that are included in Record Group 389. Many container lists and file unit lists are also searchable in the catalog, so it is a good place to start when researching the records of the Office of the Provost Marshal General. Although I am focusing today on records from World War II, there are also some records related to the Korean War and the Vietnam War in this record group, and I will share more information about that later in the presentation. This chart contains the same information as the larger organization chart that I shared earlier. This is just a slightly different view of the same subordinate offices that made up the Prisoner of War Division during World War II. As I mentioned earlier, one way to search for relevant records is to look for series that were created by or are related to these individual offices. You may also use the National Archives catalog to find what are called Creating Organization Authority Records. These are catalog entries that provide information about specific agencies, bureaus, offices, and so on. The authority records usually include the name of the office and the dates when it existed, and they can also show the hierarchy of divisions and branches that a subordinate office was part of. They frequently also list name changes for the organization. Sometimes they include a brief narrative history of an office too. Many of these authority records also include links to specific series of records associated with these offices. They are just one way to access the records in NARA's custody. This slide shows some of the catalog links to the authority records for the Prisoner of War Operations Division and related records. And this slide shows a screenshot of one of those creating organization authority records in the catalog. This entry on the left side of the slide is for the Enemy Prisoner of War Information Bureau. You can see from the title in the blue box that it was part of the Office of the Provost Marshal General within the War Department. In this iteration, the office existed from 1942 to September 1947. I have used the red oval to highlight the hyperlink from in the catalog to the archival descriptions created by this organization. In this case, the creating organization links to two series of records, which is the second screenshot on the right-hand side of the slide. In the catalog, you could then click on one or both of these series to learn more about those particular records that were created by the Enemy Prisoner of War Information Bureau. The series I'm discussing today are just a few examples of what you might find when you are searching in Record Group 389. These three series, for example, are a good place to start if you are looking for information about a specific camp. The first series of subject files, entry A1461, was created by the Enemy Prisoner of War Information Bureau, and it contains correspondence, reports, rosters, and other records related to conditions at an individual camps. The second series, Decimal Files, entry A1459A, was created by the Provost Marshal General's Special Projects Division, 
And it also includes records related to the activities of individual camps, including social, cultural, and religious life, re-education, and other issues. The third series, subject correspondence files relating to the construction of and conditions in prisoner of war camps, entry A1457, was created by the POW Operations Division, Operations Branch, and it includes information about individual facilities, construction projects, operational records, and so on. We will look at some examples of specific documents from these three series a little later in the presentation. Some of the most common types of records found in Record Group 389 are camp inspection reports, camp labor reports, camp historical files, detention rosters, POW grave location reports, and Italian service unit reports. These files are generally arranged by type of report or file and then by the name of the camp, so you may need to identify a specific camp or at the very least a specific state or location before requesting a search of these records. Other series of subject files, decimal files, and correspondence files may also be useful when researching enemy POWs and POW camps. These series primarily contain administrative, operational, and policy-related records. Many series like these are high-level records that contain information on a wide variety of POW topics. In addition, there are also series that focus on specific issues related to prisoners of war, such as supervision or internment, care, and labor. Each of these series is described more fully in the National Archives catalog. As I mentioned earlier, many of the catalog entries include container lists or file units lists, so you can use the catalog to learn more about what might or might not be available in each series. The creating organizations for these records can also provide some clues about the contents of each series. There are also series that relate exclusively to prisoners of specific nationalities. For example, the series listed here relate to German prisoners. There are school training records, fiscal accounting records, and more. It is important to remember, though, that many of these series contain administrative and operational records. And although a few series might contain some information about individual prisoners, these records are not at all comprehensive and they do not include information about most prisoners. So I suggest that you carefully review catalog descriptions to learn as much as possible about any records of interest before planning your research visit to view the records at Archives 2. Similarly, here are a few examples of records related specifically to Italian or Japanese prisoners. And again, these records are not exhaustive, but depending on your particular research interests, they may provide some helpful information. There are also several series related specifically to Italian service units in Record Group 389. RG 389 contains some records related to the Corps of Military Police during World War II as well. So if you are interested in learning more about the activities and trainings of the military police, which was responsible for guarding POW camps, there may be some relevant information in these series. These are not primarily unit records, but there may be some information about individual units among these series. In addition to the series of records related to enemy prisoners of war during World War II, Record Group 389 also contains records related to a number of other areas, such as enemy aliens, foreign nationals and civilian internees, American POWs during World War II, investigations and internal security, and more. You may use the catalog to browse the available records and then contact the textual reference branch to learn more and plan your research visit. In order to show you some sample documents from Record Group 389 that relate to POW camps, I chose to focus on just one specific location, Fort Reno, Oklahoma. Before we discuss the sample documents, though, it is important to note that the available records for each camp can vary widely. Some camps are fairly well documented in NARS holdings, but there is little to no documentation for other camps. The POW camp that was constructed at Fort Reno was added to an existing Army facility. Fort Reno was established in 1874, and in 1908, Fort Reno was converted to a quartermaster remount depot to supply horses and mules to the military. This was still Fort Reno's primary function until 1948, when it was declared surplus and transferred to the Department of Agriculture, which still uses the land for its Grazing Lands Research Laboratory. Very little evidence of the POW camp that was built there can still be seen at the site today. And this is true for many POW camps that were constructed during World War II. The first series that we'll look at examples from today is the subject correspondence files relating to the construction of and conditions in prisoner of war camps, which is entry A1457. 
This memorandum dated November 26, 1942, to the Army's Office of the Chief of Engineers states that, quote, it is desired that you provide the minimum essential housing and facilities for 1,000 prisoners of war in accordance with the War Department construction policy at the following locations, Fort Reno Quartermaster Depot, Fort Reno, Oklahoma, and Robinson Quartermaster Depot, Fort Robinson, Nebraska. The memo further states that no additional land will be purchased, so the camp was to be constructed on existing Army property. This very brief memorandum marks the beginning of the POW camp at Fort Reno, and the first prisoners arrived at the newly constructed camp just over seven months later at the beginning of July 1943. In the same series, we find developments on the construction of POW facilities. In some cases, it was believed that portions of existing forts and other locations could be adapted for POW use. The first document here, titled Fort Reno Internment Camp, addresses this issue at Fort Reno and states that, quote, it was necessary to construct a special hospital for the thousand man internment camp because of the fact that the existing hospital is very small and cannot be expanded. Plans for the camps underwent a period of review and revision, as can be seen in the second document here, which states that, quote, the Provost Marshal General approves the layout plan of the internment camp to be constructed at Fort Reno, Oklahoma, subject to the provision that an officer's lavatory be provided. This series also contains information about sanitary problems that occurred at the camps that needed to be addressed. This example from March 1944 describes an unwelcome issue with latrines and documents a change from wood box latrines to individual water flush closets and galvanized sheet metal and concrete floors. Records like these are useful for learning more about the conditions at a given camp. Other records within this first series detail changes, improvements, and additions made to the camp facilities during their years of operation. For example, this letter from November 1943 to the Office of the Chief of Engineers states that, quote, the construction of a chapel by prisoner of war labor from salvaged materials at Fort Reno is favorably considered in view of the permanency of this post. And therefore, it is desired that you make available to the proper authority the $10,000 required for its accomplishment. Other examples of construction and changes to the facilities at Fort Reno include the approval of the location for the guardhouse and surrounding fencing, as well as the addition of a post exchange, recreational facilities, and more barracks. This is typical for the records of other camps as well. Almost none of the POW camp structures at Fort Reno still exist. Only the chapel and a small portion of a concrete water tower can still be seen today. The same is true for many of the other POW camps that were built during World War II. Records like these can shed some light on the specific facilities at a given camp, as well as the conditions there. Keep in mind, though, that the available records will vary from camp to camp. The second set of examples are from the series Decimal Files, entry A1459A. This document is a report of visit to prisoner of war camp, Fort Reno, Oklahoma, from May 1945. It provides the name of the commanding officer and a brief summary of the following areas, religion, school, library, theater, music, and sport. Many of the reports in this series also contain lists of records, books, magazines, and newspapers that were available to the prisoners. They also detail specific sports that were played and training that was offered. Another sample report that relates to Fort Reno in the decimal files is this report on field service visit from September 1945. At the time that this specific report was written, Germany and Japan had already surrendered, so it was only a matter of time before the POWs could be released. This report includes several specific recommendations, such as placing anti-Nazi prisoners in key positions within the camp, publicizing the correspondence courses that were being offered, adding more books to the library, adding more records by American composers, and creating a camp newspaper. These opportunities served the dual purpose of keeping the prisoners occupied and exposing them to pro-democracy and pro-American or pro-allied ideals. Even though these reports do not contain information about individual prisoners, they really do provide insight into the non-labor activities of specific POW camps. The Decimal Files series also includes various field service camp surveys. As this example for Fort Reno shows, there are sections for general information, education, library and reading rooms, motion pictures, religious activities, camp publications, recreational activities, segregation, radio, art, and music. 
reports like these really can provide a snapshot of life within the camp at a given time. The last series that I will share some examples from is the series Subject Files, entry A1461. These first sample documents all relate to the transfer or potential transfer of individual prisoners, both into and out of Fort Reno. Prisoners might be transferred from one camp to another for a variety of reasons, such as for their own safety, for medical or health reasons, or based on their nationality and political ideology. The document on the left states that the prisoners, quote, were transferred to this camp, Fort Reno, for safekeeping, for having given information to military authorities at Camp Tonkawa, which disclosed the identity of prisoners of war at that camp who killed another prisoner at Tonkawa. And the top document on the right states that, quote, this man is a violent anti-Nazi and disrupts the smooth running and efficiency of the company in which he is a member. He is outspoken in his criticisms of the German army, all non-commissioned officers, all German officers, and others with whom he comes in direct contact. He deliberately stirs up trouble and ill will at this camp. And finally, the document on the right states, quote, as subject prisoners of war are not in any apparent danger, it is recommended that prisoners of war not be transferred to an anti-Nazi camp. And again, this is typical of the type of document that you might find for any camp in this series. Well, many of the reports in the second series we looked at, the decimal files, relate to cultural and recreational issues. This third series, the subject files, includes camp labor reports that document the number of prisoners available for work and the amount of paid labor that was recorded at certain intervals. The reports do not include information about the employment of individual prisoners, but some do provide a more detailed breakdown of the duties or labor performed. The subject files are also a good place to search for rosters of specific camps. These are just two examples of the rosters for Fort Reno. The rosters typically include the full name, internment number, date of birth, rank or grade, organization, date of capture, and affiliations of each prisoner. In the case of Fort Reno, the rosters are arranged primarily by German military unit. These two examples are for the 10th Panzer Division and the 164th Africa Division. There are no name or unit indexes to these records. So, for example, if you are looking for a roster to confirm where a specific POW was held, you would need to know the name or location of a camp in order to conduct a search for those rosters. The subject files also contain inspection reports completed both by subordinate offices within the Office of the Provost Marshal General and by external organizations. These are two such examples. The document on the left outlines a December 1944 visit by a representative of the legation of Switzerland who was accompanied by an individual from the Special War Problems Division of the Department of State. The document on the right is a translation of a report about an International Red Cross visit that took place in August 1944. As I mentioned earlier, these are by and large textual records, but occasionally you may find charts, maps, diagrams, or photographs interfiled among the records. This drawing, for example, shows the layout of the POW camp enclosure at Fort Reno. There are almost no traces of any of these structures left today, so records like this can provide visual details that the textual records don't always capture. And finally, the subject files also include documentation of the inactivation of Fort Reno, as can be seen in the sample document here. This particular POW camp was inactivated on May 14, 1946, although the Quartermaster Remount Depot was active at Fort Reno for another two years. Because Fort Reno was an established Army facility prior to being selected as the site for a POW camp, it already had a post cemetery. A portion of that cemetery was walled off and became the final resting place for 62 German and eight Italian prisoners of war. Most of these men died at other POW camps in Oklahoma and Texas that did not have cemeteries of their own. In fact, only one German POW interred in the post cemetery at Fort Reno died during his imprisonment at that camp. Now that we've discussed some of the types of documents that can be found within Record Group 389, I'd like to close by briefly discussing related records and other resources for further research. Record Group 389 does contain some information about other POWs who were not held in the U.S. In addition, some POWs that were captured by the American forces were also transferred to the custody of other allied nations. And again, records related to individual prisoners were returned to their countries of origin after the war, regardless of where that individual was held. So if you are researching a specific POW, you should contact the military archives of those countries for further assistance. 
Although Record Group 389 is the main source for records related to enemy POWs and POW camps in World War II, various other military agencies and organizations were also involved in planning, management, decision-making, construction, and other aspects of imprisoning enemy combatants. Depending on your specific area of research, you may want to explore some of these other record groups to search for additional potentially relevant records. The records of many non-military agencies may also contain some useful information. Again, depending on your particular area of interest, you may wish to explore these avenues of research too. In addition, several other record groups contain photographs of enemy POWs and POW camps. Many of the photographs that I used in this presentation can be found in these digitized series. You may access them all through the National Archives catalog. Please be aware, though, that most of these photographs do not include the names of the prisoners in the images. Some additional NARA resources, like blogs and publications, as well as a copy of the War Department Decimal Filing System Manual, are available on archives.gov. Plus, you may want to check out History Hub, the National Archives online research support community. The Army itself also provides some information and publications that you might be interested in, and you may contact them directly for additional guidance about these resources. And finally, other resources like historical newspapers can be a great source of information. Plus, you may want to contact historical societies, libraries, archives, and other state and local organizations. Their collections and resources are more likely to relate to the camps and prisoners that were held in their particular areas. In fact, several of the images that I shared today came from the Fort Reno Historical Society. These are just a few extra options that you might pursue as you research enemy prisoners of war and POW camps in the U.S. during World War II. Thank you, and I'm looking forward to your questions. Please also feel free to contact the Textual Reference Branch at Archives2 for more information. Thank you, Rachel. And dear audience, we continue to take your questions in the chat. At the end of the program, would you please take a minute to complete our short online evaluation form? We plan future programs based on your feedback. If we did not get to your question, please send us an email. Note that the presentation's video recording and handouts will remain available on this YouTube page and our website. Although this concludes the video portion of the broadcast, we will continue to take your questions in chat for another 10 minutes. Please stay if you have questions. Thank you for attending.